Welcome back to another episode of Black Hat Python. This is one that I'm sure a lot of people have been waiting for. We're going to be using our you know, our Windows exploitation here to get a uh, remote code execution, get a shell on the system. And of course, down the line, we will be pretty soon integrating this with our C2 framework that we're building, our C2 bot. Not, not really a framework, but uh, the bot that we're building, the C2 command and control server, right? And uh, yeah, this is where things get really interesting. So the first thing we're going to do is have this spawn calc.exe. That's normally a good way to test, kind of like the ping test. But in this case, since we have access to our target machine right here, we are going to first uh, just do the proof of concept that way, you know, just to reduce the amount of variables that are in play. And then once we get that, we will have it connect back to our netcat listener, get that nice reverse shell that we all love. So the code here, not too much going on, and uh, it can get a little bit complex. Uh, if you guys, you know, when you watch these videos, I got to always reiterate this, watch these videos, you don't understand quite what's happening. Don't beat yourself up. This stuff is hard. This stuff is difficult to understand. We're going to be dealing with memory in this case. I know that's something that could scare a lot of people, but um, I'll show you guys how to really dive in and understand what's happening. So let's start down in the main function here. First thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and put in the URL here of this is our Kali Linux machine, and we're going to be hosting the shellcode bin file. The really cool thing about this is our code is not even going to touch disk, which as an attacker is a very important thing uh, to try and stay off disk at all costs, right? And so we're going to have it grab the uh, binary shellcode. And uh, from there, we're going to pass it to the get code function. And what this get code function is going to do is it's going to de decode the base64 because as you'll see in a little bit, the shellcode.bin file is actually base64 encoded. And the reason we do that is so that when it's going across the network, um, none of the data gets mangled. Uh, so that's the whole purpose of encoding stuff in base64 is that you can preserve the integrity of the data because we want our shellcode to be able to work, right? So since we're encoding in base64, we then must decode the base64. We're using URL lib to do this. And the reason for that over... Uh, like a Python requests is that URL lib is more of a baseline package. Some systems, your target system might not have uh, requests installed, you know, via Python. And then that's another dependency you're going to have to pick up. And that's a little bit no more noise you're going to need to make on the network. So whenever you can use the built-in stuff, that's why it's actually important to, to learn not only how to do things with requests, but also the, lower level modules like a URL lib. So just wanted to explain that. And uh, th we're going to actually have to decode it as bytes in this case, right? So we read the response, decode as bytes, and then we'll store that as the shell code. So now we have the shell code, right? So we're going to return that value. So th it then gets stored into this uh, shell code variable outside of that function. So now we have access to it outside the function. And we will call the run function right here, passing in shell code. And here is, to be honest with you guys, where things start to get a little bit more complicated. So what we're doing here is we're allocating a buffer uh, that's going to hold our shell code. And we're going to use C types in order to do this, in particular, the create string buffer uh, built in function. And uh, you know, once we do that, we can call the write memory function and actually write this buffer into memory. So that's why we're passing the buffer into write memory. And uh, here's where things continue to get a little bit complex here, but we're, we'll break it down, right? We're taking the length here, the length of the buffer, storing that as the length variable. And then we're using, so this might look like a kernel 32 virtual alloc. If you look here, Here's where we define this. So it's actually technically it's ctypes.windll.kernel32.virtualalloc.resttype. Uh, so this is where things can get really confusing. So to help you guys out, we'll be pulling up some documentation here in a second. So this is a pointer. That's what you need to know. ctypes.c uh, underscore void underscore p is a, it's a pointer. Okay. So these are pointers. This is size. So, okay, 
let's uh let's take a look right at this next one the virtual alec right so basically you know we need to create some space in memory where we can inject our shell codes for the, so the first thing we need to do is actually you know create that the width the proper width in memory that is the same width as our you know generated payload that's why we're taking the length right so when we when we allocate memory uh, a memory address space when we allocate the memory so that we can inject our shell code in we need to make sure that it is the right width because if the widths don't match up then you know our payload is going to get cut off and it's not going to run properly so that is the reason we are storing this length here because we need to make sure they both match they both align and from there we can actually use the virtual alloc function to allocate that memory. Now, this was the part that kind of stumped me at first. Why? What did these values mean? Like, why? Why is this um, written the way it is? And what the book points out is that this zero x forty actually corresponds to the privileges. So, in this case, uh, read, write, execute, which we need to have these permissions in order to be able to write uh, into memory. Um, and, you know, basically be able to write and execute our shell code. But they don't, what the book doesn't do is they don't explain what any of these other three things are, right? So that is where the, uh, it comes into play to look at the documentation. So let's do that. So I found here through Python dev here, these, th this documentation that uh, you have this virtual alloc here and it expects null, size, and then either mem commit or mem reserve. We'll get to that in a second. And then the page read write, okay? And uh, also a little bonus fact for you guys is that if you were doing this in uh, on a Linux system, instead of virtual alloc, you would use mmap, and these would be the expected parameters. So that's what these things are, right? And so we see we have none, and we have... Um, you know, basically none is Python's version of null. And then we have our size as the next thing. So our size is going to be the length, right? So that they align. And our read write is 0x40. But what is this 0x3000? I had to dig a little bit deeper to find that information. But within Microsoft's documentation, I found that it is the allocation type. And they say this is typically either mem commit or mem reserve, which mem reserve is 0x3000, and that will reserve and commit an allocation in a single step. So that's what that is. It's a very common thing you will see when you're using virtual allocation is to have this third per, uh, parameter as 0x3000. So that was virtual alloc, but what is this RTL move memory? Well, this is where we're actually moving the memory into the address space that we allocated because this is a two-step process like i was saying first we allocate the memory and we make sure the memory we allocate is the same as the size of our payload and then next we have to actually move our payload into that address space right and i know this could probably sound crazy uh, and confusing to people that are super new but don't worry or even people that have been at it for a while uh it could be confusing let me know in the comments section below if you want me to exp explain how um how functions work and how memory works, like uh, how pointers, how pointers and uh, functions work, because that's kind of the prerequisite knowledge to this. And uh, if there is um, demand for that, I can make a video on that. It's not too complicated what we would need to know for something like this, but I am kind of taking that part for granted um, that you would know how uh, things are stored and retrieved. So um, on on the on the heap that is, I believe I believe this is on the heap. So, uh, what we can do from here, right, is uh, this RTL move memory, right? We're moving it into memory. And one thing the book mentions that I would not have known otherwise is that to ensure that the shell code will run, whether it's either 32 or 64 bit Python, uh, what we want to do is specify the result that we want back from uh, the virtual alloc as a pointer. So that's why we're actually returning this pointer here. And uh, not only that, that's also why we have these arg types here, these arguments. So we see there's three arguments. Two of them are pointers denoted by this, right? And then this last one is a size. 
So that is that is kind of what that is there. And uh, then you'll just move the pointer. You pass in the pointer, buff, uh, and then, you know, our buffer, and the length. So that will move it into memory. So now we have... We have our shell code in that memory address. Now, all we need to do in order to execute the shell code is to uh, actually tell that pointer to go to that address in memory uh, during execution. Uh, so we just finished this part of the code. Now we find ourselves back in the run function right here. We'll define a variable shell func and uh, we'll do ctypes.cast and basically um, all this cast is doing is allowing us to cast the buffer to act like a function pointer. That way we can call the shell code as we would, same as we would any Python function. And again, I can explain th how to do that in another video if you're not sure how the functions work and pointers and things like that. So from here, we now that we've actually done that, and this is a pointer, we can just call that pointer and it'll go ahead and point to the space in memory where our shell code is and it'll run it. So... Simple as that, right? So let's go over to our Kali box where we will generate some shell code using MSF Venom to uh, start demoing this stuff, get it going, right? The, uh, the fun part of the video, if you will. So what we're going to do is MSF Venom, and you can see previous payload there, thanks to ZSH. So mine is a 64-bit machine this um commando vm in the case of the book they were doing it against a 32-bit machine so you might have to change this depending on what you're using so if you have a 64-bit machine like i do and probably like most people do you would want to make sure that you include x64 as the payload so we'll spawn calc.exe and we'll write that to shellcode.raw Give that a second to complete. And then what we're going to need to do, there's one more step. We have to actually base64 encode this. Remember, because we want to transfer this across the network, make sure nothing gets mangled. And we have already written our payload to decode base64. So let's do it. Um, so we can do something like this. And uh, now we'll see we got these two files here. If I look at the file type of this, the .bin file, we will see that ASCII text with very long lines. But if we look further into this, we'll see a base64 encoded string. So perfect. Let's host this file on our server now. And all we need to do is come back over the commando VM and we'll just go ahead and run without debugging. And there you go. We see that we have gotten our proof of concept to work. We have spawn calc and we can use it just as we would normally use calc. So that proves we do have code execution on this machine. Now let's make this interesting, right? Let's get a connection back. And the cool thing is if you notice, when I'm when I'm about to make this change here, I would absolutely not touch the uh, target system at all. We can now do this all from our attacker machine. So all I need to do is generate a different payload. And uh, instead of saying to spawn calc, I will go ahead and make this one... Um, I guess I could have kept a lot of that stuff, really didn't have to backspace out all of that. But what I'll say, instead of execute a single command, I'll say, hey, spawn a reverse TCP <clears throat> shell. And then I'll say, we're going to listen on port 1337 uh, in raw format and save it to shellcode.raw. So while I'm doing that, I'll fire up the Netcat, uh, the Netcat listener down here and start listening. So now that's been written. You can up arrow a little bit here and uh, just run this same base64 command to encode, and now we're good to go. And we could even script this process out a little bit if we wanted to, if there's something we did frequently, but uh, not too many steps involved here, so just typing it up manually. But now that we have those files, we overwrote the previous ones, we can then go ahead and execute it here. And again, once we integrate this with the C2 framework, we won't even have to do anything on the client side. We can issue this command uh, from our command and control server to actually go ahead and run this, so... Just to clarify that there. Uh, but for right now, for testing purposes, we'll run it from the target. Also, let's not forget to fire up our HTTP server here to host out these files. And uh, then we'll go ahead and run without debugging once again. And uh, yeah, then we'll go ahead and check back on our machine. And we see we have gotten a shell. 
and you can do the who am I? We are IE user on Commando. So perfect. Um, awesome. I, I always love uh, doing stuff like this. It really brings everything full circle back to the, you know, back to the roots of it. So I always, yeah, I, I always thought this was like really cool. Like anytime you can get a shell, especially if it's something you completely code, um, you know, from scratch pretty much. Yeah, it's really Really cool uh, program, in my opinion. Let me know what you guys think down in the section below, and we'll be expanding this C2 bot here, and we'll be actually taking all these functions that we built and integrating them in the overall um, C2 uh, program. So hopefully that sounds interesting to you guys. If so, be sure to comment, uh, like, and subscribe to the channel. And uh, if you're interested in catching up on the series, you can uh, just watch the videos on screen right now. I always will have them up there at the end of the videos for you guys. See you guys right over there. Thanks for watching.